The debate over private emails for public work, a financial emergency in Wayne County, redrawing the voting lines and big decisions for Detroit City Council and Trump. Stay put. My week starts right now. Recently, Michigan's economy has begun to turn around. Michigan's gained over 250,000 new jobs. We've paid off $20 billion in long-term debt. And our population is increasing for the first time in a decade. But to make Michigan a top 10 state, there's still plenty of work to be done. Step up and help put Michigan on top. Learn what you can do at michigan-turnaroundplan.com. Funding is also provided by Delta. Hi there, welcome to My Week. I'm Christy McDonald. We are so glad that you're with us. We have a full lineup for you tonight. Financial emergencies, emails, party lines, and Trump. So coming up, should Detroit City staffers conduct office business through private email? The fallout from a story this week. Also, a push in Lansing to let citizens help decide our voting districts. Plus, the Detroit City Council with some big decisions on the agenda. Are they making the tough calls? And Trump, Love him, hate him. His candidacy is changing what we think of as presidential. We'll talk about it. But coming up first, it's official. The governor signs off on a financial emergency in Wayne County. So let's get right to it. And our contributors, Nolan Finley of the Detroit News and Stephen Henderson of the Detroit Free Press. Gentlemen, it's good to see you as always. So we start off with the uh, financial emergency in Wayne County, which is no, no surprise. This is, this is not breaking news. This is just kind of the official stamp as they go along the process. But Nolan, you wrote something very interesting about how this financial emergency might lend to some um, some moving around of the of the shells and some finances with the state and give them a little more clout to see what they'd like to see happen in Wayne County. Well, one of the things that has to be settled in this is there's got to be an answer to the Wayne County jail mess. That thing's sitting there unfinished, no money to finish it, cost of $1.2 million a month in debt service and security and maintenance. Uh, they've got to come up with an answer for it. The state has wanted for a long time to see that complex move to Mound Road. Uh, and you have Gilbert now, the Gilbert organization, offering to buy the Guardian building where the county offices are, uh, a parking deck that goes with it, and this jail site for about $150 million. That gives them uh, some seed money to start to work at, um, at Mound Road. They can't find any money anywhere to finish the the, the jail site, so I don't know what they do. I think that's the the most logical, likely outcome of this. But how much money would it take to to outfit the Mound Road site and get it up to up to par? And how much money would it take to finish the jail project? Aren't you looking at roughly the same? You're amount? looking at about the same amount, 400 million. It'd take about 300 million to finish the jail. But they're also committed to fixing the Frank Murphy Hall of Justice and uh, the juvenile facility, which is gonna cost another 100 million. So it puts the price tag at about the same. And you know you can do all of that at Mount Road. It's not ideal from the county's point of view, maybe from the public's point of view, but it's a solution and there, are, there doesn't seem to be any other solutions anywhere near the table. All right, so pretty interesting, Stephen. You want a little bit of help from the state? Well, then maybe the state will exert a little influence on how they like to see things done with Wayne County. Yeah, I'm not sure what the attachment to the Mound Road facility is. I mean, from a practical standpoint, there are a lot of drawbacks to putting it there. Uh, it, that's too far from the courts that are usually connected with with jails. Uh, it's also uh, a more remote site for people to have to go visit people in, in, in jail. I mean, it's just, it's, there's a reason that most jails are in city centers if they're in, if they're inside cities. They're, they're you know, whether it's a convergence of highways and, and other things like that. Um, but there's no money to finish the one downtown. I mean, they can't go and borrow what they would need to do what we all agreed was the best plan, at least for the jail and the, the, the sort of court center downtown. So I'm not sure that there's much other choice. Uh, uh, I, I do think that, that the question of whether it should be on that site downtown also is something worth revisiting because downtown has changed so much since we made right. that decision. Um, but it's, you know, it's a mess. And so it, it's one of those situations where we made a big enough mess that there's no ideal way out of it, this might be the only well, one. And you know, the, the plan the state would like to see is move everything, courts and everything out there so that- It's just the middle so, of nowhere. So that 
that you know they they are together or you could do video conferencing which is yeah. you know more and more common common today but there you know this thinking of that that as you said it doesn't belong downtown you could do so much more with that space mm -hmm. and in the end you might have easier access at Mound Road in terms of parking congestion what have you for hard for the public it is a little hard to get to all right before we leave the financial emergency um, all along Warren Evans has said you know what hey we need some help from the state and I think a consent agreement will be will be the best possible thing do we know that in fact that Wayne County would not get an emergency manager I don't think Wayne County is going to get an emergency manager this is a more cordial process than what Detroit went through uh, uh, Wayne County is volunteering for this process what what Warren Evans is looking for specifically is some leverage with the unions and if he can hold that emergency manager hammer over their heads and say look make a deal or it's going to get a lot worse uh, you know he would like them to believe that emergency manager management is a possibility I'm sure all right turning now to city emails and should city work be done with personal accounts Detroit's Corporation Council used his Gmail account as well as a city email to conduct city business with the ambassador bridge owners and the free press reported it after requesting public emails about the deal harmless maybe until it comes time for a city to keep track of or turn those private emails over Stephen, when I read this story it all of a sudden had the shades of the controversy that's been following around Hillary Clinton for the past year or so well it's a, exactly the same and uh, you know I'm, I'm not sure why if you were a government official you wouldn't just tell everybody uh, in your employ listen if you're gonna do something official do it in the the, the official email because it protects you uh, and your personal account from from you know the prying of, of public eyes and it protects the city in terms of uh, having that record to be able to turn over when people ask for it. Uh, now I understand that the, te the technological limitations inside the city had something to do with this that it's difficult to access the city's email system from outside from remote uh, sites because it's so old and they're working on that. And that's a, that's um, such a huge problem because uh, the amount of work that people do yeah, off-site yeah. is is amazing. Yeah, but I mean I think in an era where everybody has two or three email accounts on their phone and can just sort of pick which one they're using, I think you've got to make it clear to them if you're in government you use the official account when you're doing uh, city business and don't don't use a personal account. And they should have learned from the whole Kwame situation when you when <laughs> well, that was the opposite. Business, do it on a personal <laughs> a personal phone. But I mean this reflects sort of this I think what I think is the arrogance of the political class that uh, you know they're not as accountable or don't feel as accountable as they should feel and this should be part of the city's ethics policy this should be codified that when you're doing city business you do it on a city email you don't try to hide things uh, the Duggan administration needs to be a lot more committed to transparency well I, I think that their argument though is that we weren't hiding anything we gave you the documents that that you requested well, they for volunteered to, right, they, right they volunteered to give us but the documents the you never know when somebody's hiding. but is it almost like are we talking about an honor system is it next time around if it's not this administration right. maybe it's an administration down the road that maybe did not turn over one one is that is that the problem here I think that's exactly the problem is that you're, you're counting on them to to be able to, to reach into people's personal email to get the things out and what if what if Butch Hallowell had said hey you know what I don't want to I don't want to share my private emails uh, with you now you've got to find a way to compel that employee to turn over their How would you do email. that? Well, well, I mean, in, in court, you probably could argue that, look, anything you were doing that has to do with official business is public record, even if it is in your private email. But again, you don't need to. You don't need to have that fight. The, the, the policy should be: don't do private, uh, don't do public business in your private email. And you can see from the Hillary Clinton situation, the the problems with it. I mean she has first said oh gosh I turned over everything and then we find out she didn't turn over everything but before she turned over anything she went through and deleted, and deleted what she stuff. classified as personal no third party verification of that it's a it's you, you you don't know what to believe or, or who to trust in these situations because you're solely at the mercy of what the employee tells all right, turning now to redistricting. Wait, wait, don't don't zone out. This is important <laughs> stuff. This week in Lansing, now don't do that to me, Nolan. Democrats vowed to reintroduce legislation for a citizen-led redistricting commission. Now, usually the political boundary lines for our elected representatives are drawn by the party in power after the census every 10 years. 
which leads to grumbling by the party not in power that the lines were drawn to favor the party that is in power. But a recent Supreme Court ruling said a citizen commission is a valid model. And even if this change isn't done to the state statute, this question could come to a ballot near you. So this is actually very important stuff. Stephen, I'm going to start with you. I it's tell going, people I'm going to give, you, I'm give you time to formulate a response. I'm going to start with you. This week in Lansing, they're, they're starting to say, you know what, maybe this is something that we should be doing here in Michigan. The push is on. I tell people all the time that you got to pay really close attention to stuff like this. People always complain about Lansing, whether they are Democrats or Republicans. People are frustrated with the inability to get stuff done. Uh, they feel like uh, the people there are, are somewhat out of touch with what people in the state want. This is one of the reasons that, that you are allowing, we allow uh, elected representatives to choose the people they represent as opposed to the people choosing their representatives. When you let them draw the maps, they draw it in a way that it's going to advantage them and, and the people's concerns get pushed to the side. I think Arizona is a really great example of how this can work differently. They've done this now. This was the, the state whose case ended up at the Supreme Court. They've done this now for a while and there's a really nice balance uh, in, the, in the, the congressional representatives from that state that represents the, the mix of political views in that state. Uh, uh, of course, it was the, the legislature who got upset uh, the Republican legislature got upset because they lost some seats in this in this process. Uh, they want to draw the lines themselves. I, there, there's no question that the, the intent, and it, also here in Michigan, the intent of our Constitution is that we should be able to do this. It was the courts that took it away from us. So uh, uh, I, I don't think there's much question about whether we should do it. It's about how to set up the commission to figure out how to do it a little more, uh, in, a, in a little more balanced way. Nolan. Well, I, you know, I think, um, well, I'd wonder if in 2020, if the Democrats are back in power, if they'll be so eager to see this I legislation. I think that shouldn't pass. matter. It's well, not it about which, it shouldn't it be shouldn't, either party. It shouldn't, but we'll see what happens to this legisl legislation if in 20, 2018 they take, uh, the Democrats take back control of Lansing. But <laughs> I think the, the problem here is, is, is how do you form a commission that is any less partisan or any less biased than, than the legislature might be. If you, if you make these elected commissioners, then you've got special interest, unions, chamber, whatever, con trying to control the process because it will be like state school board um, elections or where you don't really know who the candidates are and so it gives the special interest groups tremendous influence. I, I think forming an unbiased commission is a, a very challenging task and I'd have to see how they how they intend to put the commission together. Well, again, yeah, but Arizona's, the doing fact that Arizona's doing it. That, that the doing conversation it. Is, is starting right now and that we're not ignoring yeah. the conversation, yeah. but we've got time to be able to come up with something. Well, sure. I mean, there's, there's something wrong with this argument that, okay, the system we have is biased, so the only better system is a, quote, unbiased system. I mean, you can remove significant bias from the system by improving uh, the, the process, and I don't think we should make... Uh, the perfect, the enemy of the good. So what would that look like? Good. What do they do in Arizona? So in Arizona, the, both parties have uh, uh, two appointments, I think, to, to the commission, and then the third appointment is uh, done independently. And what it's done, so what that does, you got to have three votes to, to get a, any map approved. So you, you can't have one party dominate but where's the process. The, uh, what's the, the independent vote? Yeah, I can't, I, I'm not sure I mean, how they're doing that. To me, that's that. the devil in, in terms of Well, it would, it would have to be someone who hasn't held it's public office, difficult. someone who, who's not yeah, a lobbyist, who someone, I mean, well then, yeah, yeah. there you go. I mean, somebody like uh, a CRC, I mean, we have independent uh, government-minded, government reform uh, uh, institutions okay. in the state that would be pretty decent at, at picking somebody to draw these maps uh, or to help draw these maps. And then I, I, I'm not sure of the exact details of how they're doing it in Arizona. I think it is a five-member commission, though. The, the, the issue is that's better than having the legislature just nakedly go in and draw partisan lines. I mean, that's what, that's what we're doing here. There's no question that anything would be better than that. Well, it doesn't seem that there's any traction right now in Lansing from the Republicans to even get on board with anything like this. Is Do you think there would be enough, I guess, will in Lansing, though, Nolan, to come up with some kind of ballot initiative to get this on the ballot? Well, I'm, I'm you know, I, if somebody can come up with the money to fund a ballot initiative, I would expect it to be on there. I don't expect, I wouldn't expect the Republicans, just like I wouldn't expect the Democrats if they were in power, yeah, to voluntarily cede their yeah. the authority. That doesn't happen in, 
in, in, in politics. Uh, you'd have to have a civic-minded group raise a ton of money for a ballot initiative. Might not take a whole lot. I mean, I think this would be one where people might read it and say, yeah, I'm, I'm all in favor of that. But any kind of ballot initiative is going to cost a few million dollars. All right. Let's check in now on Detroit City Council. They've had some big decisions on their agenda lately, and one they just made to hike water rates 7.5%. The other, a land deal between the city and the Ambassador Bridge owners, has been postponed again. And this week, an editorial in the Detroit News says some council members are, quote, balking at tough decisions. And uh, since you're uh, with the Detroit News editorial yeah, I mean, board, I'm going to start with you, Nolan. Explain that. Wh who, why are they balking at tough decisions? Well, there's still a lot of pandering going on. They knew they'd had to raise those rates when the when the issue came before them. If they didn't, it would throw this whole bankruptcy, post-bankruptcy process into chaos. Um, and yet, you know, they took the vote they felt the public wanted them to take instead of the responsible vote. Now, they came back and most of them did, did the right thing in the end, but they're going to have to, to, to come to a, a mindset that there are tough decisions still ahead in this bankruptcy process, and they're going to have to make them without all the showboating. Do you think they're showboating, Stephen? I don't. I don't think it, uh, it's showboating. I mean, I think there were some problems about the way this this rate hike was presented to the council in the first place. Uh, the the water authority could have done a better job. Uh, city officials could have done a better job of explaining that up front to to, to members who were understandably skeptical. Skeptical. I think again, you know, you it's their constituents who are facing the shutoffs and things uh, that that are that are now part of this newly con configured uh, uh, water authority. Uh, it's, there's nothing wrong with them saying, wait, I, I want to think about this and I want to see what effect this is going to have on them or think about what effect it's going to have on them before so I do it. So you think there's a the fine end, line between right balking thing. and due diligence? Well, I think, I think it's okay to, to think about stuff and, and, and wait and say, I want some more information before I'm, I'm going to sign off on this. And in the end, we did get what we needed out of them. We, they, they voted for the, for, the, uh, for the rate hike, avoided the, the, the deficit in, uh, in, the, in DWSD. So it, it did go that way. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm still in the counseling patience uh, mode with this council. If you think about what this council was like eight years ago, 12 years ago, we are light years uh, ahead of that. And, but we still have light years to go before we have the kind of legislative body that we that we all really need in Detroit. We're not going to make that jump instantly. Uh, there, there are going to be bumps in the road and there's going to be uh, things that don't go exactly the way they should immediately. You know, unspoken in all this is, though, is, is what happened to the 4% rate hike uh, promise that was made when the well, water Well, that's 4%, water, that's 4%. Uh, the fine print? Uh, right. I mean, that, that the 4% is just about the, the DWSD rate. It's not about the, the and, local rate. And I think that's what was disingenuous in the selling of this deal from the beginning. Everybody knew it wasn't going to be 4%, except no. they, you know, they, they pitched that out there. We'll never have a 4% rate hike and probably shouldn't with the infrastructure uh, uh, needs of the of the system, but right. to tell people up front, well, we're going to cap it at four percent. Well, you're capping was, the DWSD hike. At, I know, but what do people care about? They care about what goes out in the monthly check, and they're they're going to see seven to fifteen percent rate hikes. Some of them more because of, because the local uh, authorities added on. All right, let me, before we leave uh, City Council and the job that they're doing right now, I want to touch on this land deal with the city and the Maroon family and the fact that there's been so many, um, so many delays in the vote on this and um, a lot of concern from residents who live in southwest Detroit about this deal and, and with the park, Nolan Phillison. Well, the, you, Duggan's uh, flirting with the Maroons a little bit, I think, much to the consternation of the governor. The governor is not crazy about, uh, you know, leading on the Maroons to believe they're going to get to build a second bridge. They're not. Uh, the Canadians aren't going to approve uh, a side-by-side -side bridge for the Ambassador Bridge. They're committed to this second crossing, the international, or the Gordie Howe Bridge now, I guess we can call <laughs> it's it. It's not and, the Drake uh, anymore. <laughs> you could say. And so I, I think there's a, a little bit of, of uh, friction between the governor's office and the mayor's office over this. And, I, you know, I think... Um, you know, the mayor is, is trying to see what he can get out of the Maroons, but I, I think one thing he knows he's not going to get is a bridge. And, and well, it leaves council also sitting on this deal, too, because they're the ones that are, are waiting. Uh, well, for I them. think you have council members, uh, specifically the one who represents that area, saying, hold on a second. Again, what does this do to constituents in that, in that area? I think this deal has been a distraction, though, from a bigger issue, which is how does the city deal with 
the uh, the bridge company, which is the largest private landowner in in the city uh, or, or or close to it, uh, holder of some really problematic properties that we have not in the past been successful in getting them to do better with. Uh, I think the Duggan administration is saying, you know, instead of you know constantly punching at them and and trying to bully them into things. Let's sit down and treat them like we would anyone else. Negotiate with them, find out what they want, what we want, and come to some agreements about, to, to get some of this stuff done. The bridge question, I think, is also interesting. Uh, I think it changes a little now that the, 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 the now that the, the, the Gordy Howe Bridge is certain. You're going to have to replace the Ambassador Bridge. Uh, it's it's almost 90 years old, I think, at, at this point. It's not going to be there for another 20 or 30 years. So he's going to have to build a bridge next to that to replace the ambassador. I think the, the, the opposition we had to his bridge as an alternative to the Downriver Bridge changes now that that one's a certainty. We got to build a, we have to build a third bridge uh, to replace the ambassador. I wonder if he'll build that if the Gordy Howe Bridge starts and becomes a reality. Is, is, you don't think That's we need right. to? Well, I do think we, we ultimately need two bridges. I just don't know that Maroon's going to build his third bridge with that bridge with that second I mean, you'd tear the ambassador up. now. Well, then you, would you tear it down before you start construction? No, you no, would build the second the first, bridge, yeah. you'd leave the ambassador open, build a, the, a bridge next to it. Uh, and I think that that's a different it. question because you, you could use all the same infrastructure, you're not changing traffic patterns, and that's the concern. Canada He's already started right that now. process. I mean, all that construction he did next to the ambassador was about uh, uh, using that same infrastructure to build a new bridge. I think, the, again, the calculus changes now uh, that, that the Downriver Bridge is a certainty. I'm not sure that the opposition to the Maroons building another bridge makes, um, makes as much sense. All right, and you couldn't pick up a paper or watch TV without seeing Donald Trump this week. He's coming to Michigan in a few weeks. He's leading the GOP presidential hopeful pack in a recent poll, and he's offended people with attacks on Mexican immigrants and John McCain, but he's obviously finding traction with some voters, which leads to a bigger question. Is he redefining what voters think of as presidential? And, and, and what I mean by that is he's been asked now several times by interviewers, and it's so interesting because, I mean, he is just reaping free airtime like nobody's business. He had another primetime interview an hour long last night on CNN. And they asked him, if you are elected president, are you still going to conduct yourself in this manner of personal attacks, personal insults, um, you know, something that's kind of less than what we term to be presidential. And he <laughs> said, you know, I'll pro it'll probably be a little different, but I, I don't see how it would be much different. But let's get back to that original question is, is he changing what we think of as presidential? And is that a fair definer? I don't think anybody thinks Donald Trump's going to be president, including <laughs> Donald Trump. Donald Trump is an entertainer, and this is feeding into that sort of entertainment <laughs> empire he's trying to, to build, that cult of personality, you know, that he's all about. My question is, why do you have networks and others put constantly putting a microphone in front of a guy who is not a legitimate candidate? But see, I, how I do don't, you I don't think, see, I don't I think, think you can say he's not a legitimate so candidate. He has yeah. a 10-point lead over Jeb yeah. Bush. He's, he's got, leading the pack. Yeah. He's got endless I amounts think, of money to spend uh, on a campaign, think, and people are talking I about it. Initially, well, he doesn't have endless amounts to well, spend. Well, he's got a well, lot. I mean, he's got a lot of personal wealth that he can he dump claims. Right. Well, He claims. I mean, he's worth a couple billion dollars. Maybe. I mean, well, Maybe he's broke. You even never if know. It's two billion dollars. He just, he just released his financials. He just released his. Financials. And he's not going to spend his own money on this. Well, I, I think it was okay when he got into the race to say, "Well, look, this is a sideshow. He's not a legitimate candidate. He can't win." I still don't think he can win the nomination. But we judge we judge all these things by polls, and in the polls, he's he's out front in 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 a good number of them, and in. Key states. I, how would you dismiss him as illegitimate? I, I, I have a problem with the media. The, the, the Des Moines Register wrote, I thought, a, a really obnoxious editorial this week, saying that Trump should get out of the race uh, in, in Iowa. And I thought, well, well, who are you speaking for? People in Iowa are all about this guy. They're, they're flocking to, to, to the campaign. I think uh, it's really dangerous for us to say who's legitimate and who's not, and ignore the voters who get to make that For the decision. moment. For the moment, he's, well. he's got his little, the little spotlight, but he's Howard Beale. You know, he's, he's tapping into the sort of uh, discontent and, yeah. the, 
and the really unsettlement that's come over the last several months with, with a lot of cultural changes in the country and a lot of people aren't quite sure what that means or, or, or how that affects them. And they're latching on to, the, to a guy who screams, you know, I'm going to, yeah, I'm right. going to fix all this. And I was, think, and, and I think the danger, the, the, and things. again, the danger for the Republicans is how much distraction is he from the candidates who have uh, substantive policy things that they want to talk about and have to spend their time answering uh, you know, baseless, a lot of them are uh, focusing their speeches about him. Yeah, and, I mean, and the, I think the, that's the, the, the guy has taken everybody off track in the last couple of weeks, uh, and and if this continues into August into the first debates, now you've got a national spectacle with this guy at the center of it. That's not good for, for so what they want. So about to do. the right, same I, number, about the same percentage of five Republicans seconds, support Nolan, and I gotta Donald Trump wrap you up. as Democrats support Bernie Sanders. Well, and Bernie Sanders is going to be on the. They're I, not. Neither one's going to be. All right, on we the, could we could ballot. we could talk about Trump forever, but, but no one's sorry, debating whether Sanders is a legitimate candidate. He is. And that's going to do it for my week. Make sure you join us next Thursday night when yeah, Detroit Police chance, Chief right? James. They're still talking when Detroit Police Chief James Craig joins us right here in studio. But right now, head over to myweek.org. Nolan, Stephen, and I we're going to keep talking about this. It's more my week after the show. So tell us what you think on Facebook and Twitter during the week. I'm Christy McDonald. Have a great night. We'll see you next time. We can see Recently, Michigan's economy has begun to turn around. Michigan's gained over 250,000 new jobs. We've paid off $20 billion in long-term debt. And our population is increasing for the first time in a decade. But to make Michigan a top 10 state, there's still plenty of work to be done. Step up and help put Michigan on top. Learn what you can do at michigan-turnaround-plan.com. Funding is also provided by Delta.